сега ще поканя Пол, който ще ни разкаже практически за работата на консорциума. Той освен това е изпълнителен директор на Румънския център за разследваща журналистика и е в основата на множество значими проекти. Uh, so I think Christoph uh, ended up on the right note in the sense that he uh, advised you to uh, join networks and to go to conferences and to events like this. Because in fact, you can't do proper investigative reporting in this day and age without a network. So um, I work for such a network. I'm the executive director of um, uh, this organization, which is called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, as well as of the organization in Romania called RISE Project that is part of uh, this larger network. So what we do at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project is obvious. We investigate organized crime and corruption. Um, now, Christoph also, also mentioned, you know, that this is the future of investigative reporting. Um, it's, I mean, data. The fact that we have more and more data available out there makes it um, easier for us to investigate, you know, criminals, to investigate corrupt politicians, to investigate banks that maybe have a bad, bad behavior. Uh, and we're seeing right now what's, what's going on in Greece. We, we saw last year what happened in Bulgaria with, uh, with, with a bank. So it, it kind of, what, what I like to say is that it takes a network to fight a network. And that is because uh, there's no high level corruption there's no high level organized crime that is not cross-border, transnational. So in order to be able to investigate, you need to go across borders and there's a few, um, uh, uh, there's multiple ways to actually go across borders. Um, you can use people in the network, you know, and ask them for data. You know, I can ask Christoph in, uh, in Belgium, you know, to, to give me some, some information from there. Uh, you could also go uh, and jump borders via databases. Um, so that's, that's what I'll, uh, I'll talk about today. It's how to follow the money across borders, how to expose organized crime and corruption via databases. And um, I will start with a very, very simple example. We'll do the investigation together, basically. Um, because a lot of this, uh, this work is really simple. I mean, everybody uh, can do it without much, uh, much trouble, you know. Um, so, Right now, you know, uh, we're, um, you know, we have one of our uh, journalists in, uh, in jail in uh, Azerbaijan, in Baku. You know, there, there's just been this uh, uh, European Games in Baku and all this, you know. I, actually, yesterday when I arrived here in Sofia, I saw the Bulgarian team, the sports, sportsmen, uh, sportswomen that came uh, uh, back to, to Sofia after these games. So Khadija Ismailova is um, one of the best investigative reporters in, in Europe. Uh, she's Azeri and she's now in jail uh, because of her reporting. So let's take a look a little bit at uh, how her reporting went. Um, what you see here, you know, it's, uh, it's one of uh, Khadija's uh, uh, initial investigations uh, that I, uh, I helped uh, her with, uh, with the database part. So, at some point she noticed that there's uh, this village in Azerbaijan called Chovdar, and you see the, the village is in a very, very put, poor shape. Actually, the people living in this village are refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh. So they're double victims, you know, they live in this poverty, they had to leave their, you know, home place, and, uh, and so it's lots, lots of problems. But Khadija discovered that uh, there was an extra problem that came upon them, and uh, that was, um, you know, and, and we're talking here not about a big size village, we're talking about, uh, about a few hundred people. But at some point, this was their only supply of water, their only so source of water. This was for, you know, washing, for drinking, for cooking, for everything. And for a few hundred people, this is very little, right? I mean, um, so Khadija went to this village to find out what, what's going on. Um, but there, if, you'd, uh, if you talk to, uh, you know, the locals, to the villagers, and you'd ask them, so who's to blame for this problem, you know, for the lack of water, uh, people like, like this one, his name is Novruz Alakverdiev, will tell you, it's the Ingilis. Now, the Ingilis is the Azeri term for Englishman. So he, this guy was blaming the Englishman, you know, for his troubles with the water. And that was because, and if you'd ask this lady, it, it would be the same and so on. Um, now, the thing is that in the outskirts of the village, uh, this mining site popped up. 
It's, uh, so uh, there is a consortium of companies that are trying to exploit the gold that was uh, found there. So it's a gold, gold mine. It's an open pit gold mine. And they needed the water for you know, their uh, mining site works and they diverted the water from the village to this, to this place. So this is why you know, the, the place was left without water. Now, how do you start this, this type of investigation? How do you find out what's really behind it? I mean, this is direct, uh, I mean, it's, it's direct imagery. You go there, you see this thing, so there's nothing occult about it. There's, there's nothing hidden, uh, hidden about it. But, of course, I mean, investigative reporting is, right now, it's going between Google and databases. That's investigative reporting at its uh, uh, early stage. Um, now, I have one, one, one remark to make here, and, you know, we like to think that there's that all the data is online, you know, that and that everything we uh, we need is online. And my estimation is that only about 20% of the data that we need in investigative reporting is online. The rest, you know, 80% is still on paper records, is still, you know, direct observation, it's still interviews, it's still, you know, um, a lot a lot of work, a lot of field work, let's say. Um, so a simple a simple Google search with the terms Chovdar and Goldmine would give you a bunch of uh, documents, including uh, this one. This is in, uh, in Azeri, you know, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, we have Google Translate and we can, you know, but you'll, you'll find the same document in English. What this document says, and you'll see it, it is signed by uh, Mr. Ilham Aliyev. So this is a, a decree issued by the president of Azerbaijan to give the mining rights uh, in the outskirts of Chovdar to a consortium of companies. And the companies are here, so you have the names of the companies and all. In fact, the things are uh, something like this. So you have the Chovdar Goldfield, and you have this consortium of companies. Um, is there? Can I use the mic? Thanks. It's on. Okay, so uh, you see here, so there's the Chopdar Goldfield, and then there's the consortium, there's the Azeri government, and there's a bunch of other companies. But out of these companies, only one is actually registered in the UK. So if you remember that, that villager, he was blaming you know, all these problems on the, on the British. Um, now, of course, having the names of the companies, you, know, you can always check uh, who are the people behind those companies, almost always. And, but we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So in this case, uh, because we know it's a, it's a British company, it's relatively easy for us. I mean, uh, you can go to various databases to get the information about that company. So the British company in this case is called Globex International LLP. LLP is a limited liability partnership. And uh, which we get this, we pay one pound for this information, one British pound from the registry of companies. Uh, in the UK. Each country has a registry of companies, uh, as we heard from Christoph as well. Now, if we look at uh, who is involved with this company, we will see that uh, there's a company from Panama called Arblos Management. There's a second company from Panama, same address, in Panama City, the capital of Panama, Hissing Management SA, Sociedades Anonima. And another one, third, uh, third one, Linden Management Group. So you see, suddenly, we shifted from the UK to Panama via this, uh, this company record. So in fact, uh, things look kind of like this. So Globex goes into these three Panama companies. And uh, what we need to do in this case, it's again, we go to a database, this, this time to the Panamanian registry of companies which is uh, free of charge. You only have to create a login and to know a little bit of Spanish, but that's, you know, again, you can use Google Translate and all that kind of stuff. And you'll, you'll find out very easily who's behind these companies, you know. And you'll get a, a record like, like this, you know. A record that, uh, I took the record of one of those companies, Hissing Management, there's three Panama companies, you can get all three of them. And if you go down in this uh, document, what you'll see is, you know, that, uh, that Hissing Management, the directors of this company, and the shareholders of this company, are uh, two ladies and a man. The ladies are called Arzu Alieva and Leila Alieva, 
And if you Google the names, uh, you'll, you'll find that they are uh, these two ladies who are the daughters of the Azeri president. Okay, and Olivia Mestelan is an uh, associate of, of them. Now, you see, uh, now my, my question is, whom, whom should the villagers of Chovdar blame for their lack of water? So that's basically the, uh, the Azeri president, because remember the, the decree that I showed you at first that we found on Google? That's, you know, he signed, you know, the mining rights. So this is a very, very simple investigation. Like really simple. You go to the place, you take a few pictures, uh, then you do some Google searches, you know, and then you go through two registries of companies and you find out, well, you know, you know it's not the English. It, uh, actually, the, the blame is, uh, uh, lies with the uh, president of the country and his offsprings and, and all that. But now the, the interesting thing about this is, uh, and this is what, what Khadija was working on uh, quite a bit with our help, was, and this goes with all types of organized crime and corruption. It goes here in Bulgaria, it goes in my country, in Romania, it goes everywhere. Uh, with the fact that if these guys, you know, if the corrupt politician sees that the model works, they will apply that model over and over again. So um, they, they kind of create patterns, crime patterns, corruption patterns. So in this case, when we found this deal, we assumed from the very start that there, there must be some other instances where the Aliyevs own some sort of property back in Azerbaijan using offshore companies. And of course, we started with Panama. And now, and this is where, you know, the cooperation with, uh, with hackers uh, is very, very useful. We, at, at OCCRP, at RISE, we cooperate with hackers, we cooperate uh, with artists, you know, what you see here, you know, this film is, is made by artists, you know. And um, the idea is to, to, to kind of try to make as much as possible of the investigative reporting. So. Once we, uh, we realized that there might be more cases of such corruption, um, we actually got in touch with um, a very good hacker, a very good friend of mine now, uh, Daniel Huygen, uh, who's from the UK. And um, what Daniel did was, um, because the registry of companies in Panama, although it's free of charge, only allows you to do um, company name based searches. So if you know the name of the company, like we, we knew in this case, it's easy. You go there, you put hissing management, and you get the company records that proves, that shows you that, you know, the daughters of the president are involved with this. But you can't do, you know, usually our investigations start from a name of a person. We want to know if the prime minister of Bulgaria is corrupt. We want to know if the deputies are corrupt, the MPs, the whatever, you know. So, and you can't do that. You can't search, you know, the Panama official registry of companies uh, via names uh, of persons. So what Dan Huygen did was he scraped that registry of companies and um, he created this new website, pretty, pretty simple website. Where you see, you have two ser search options. So that's an extra search op option, name of person. So you suddenly can, can look up, you know, names of persons. And I, I suppose you're all familiar with what scraping is. Um, I mean, in, in two words, it's like you, you take a database and you copy it in your computer, in your server, you know, and then you can reshape the, the information. Because all the registries of companies are actually databases. So the, you see the interface, but imagine, I mean, behind it, uh, like a huge library, you know, like huge, you know, like, like hundreds of thousands of, of documents, you know, uh, and so on. So um, websites are... Uh, some databases are easy to, sc to scrape, some are a little bit harder, but, but this was easy to scrape. So when Dan created this website, now we can search for the name Aliyev, you know? And what we'll find out is there's a bunch of Aliyevs here, uh, you know, Nuru Aliyev, Alim Aliyev, but then we have also Leila Alieva, Arzu Alieva, the, the daughters, and the wife as well who is uh, also an uh, MP in Baku, she's not even supposed to have commercial interest and, and stuff like this. When it, we click on, on, the, on the name of Arzu Alieva, for instance, we'll find out that it's not just the three companies involved in the gold mining operation in Chovdar, but there's a, actually a lot more. So this is what, you know, Khadija investigated and 
since they are using these companies in Panama, it's very likely that they use uh, companies in other offshore uh, jurisdictions. And indeed, they are using companies in the BVI, they are using companies in Switzerland, and we are actively tracking down all those uh, right now and exposing. Actually, I published the latest article in the, this, we have this free Khadija um, kind of uh, movement where we follow you know, the money and we expose what the uh, Azari uh, first uh, ruling family is, uh, is hiding. Okay, so this is, this is a very simple example, you know, and uh, I, I have a question for you. Do you think these people are very smart? Um, wh why do you think they put their names in the company records? They think they're untouchable, yeah, that's right, that's right. But, you know, when they created these companies, and this is something that plays off over and over again to our advantage, when they created the Panama companies, the Panama Registry of Companies was completely closed. So they counted on it being left like that, you know. And suddenly, you know, the Panama uh, government was uh, pressured by the US government actually to open up their data because the US felt that their business interests are hurt because you know lots of Panama companies were involved in fraud in the US and all that. And the US, US is pressuring other countries they should clean up their act at home as well and we'll, we'll talk about Delaware companies and Nevada companies used in fraud even here in Bulgaria. But the idea is that Panama had to open up the registry. And this gave us a lot of ammo, right? I mean, we could, uh, you know, suddenly search for all these names and we use this Panama Registry of Companies you know to uh, track down the the businesses of the former uh, regime in Egypt in I mean lots of we found here lots of weapon dealers we found I mean everybody was in Panama and still is is in Panama um, and Panama still has lots lots of um, of secrets um, now let's go into a little bit smarter people you know, because not everybody's, uh, you know, as dumb as, you know, to, to, ju to just show their, uh, or leave traces like this. Um, how many of you are familiar with the uh, uh, Magnitsky case? Um, I, I will summarize for, for the ones that uh, are not familiar with it. This is the biggest uh, uh, theft from the state budget in Russia, probably in the past 20 years. It's hundreds of millions of dollars that were stolen from the Russian, Russian budget. Uh, and what happened was there was a tax return, a fraudulent tax return from a tax office in, in Moscow that was uh, done on a, you know, on a Christmas Eve. You know, someone went and said, okay, my company ha needs to cash in these 230 million US dollars, you know, worth of rubles, of course, but this was the, the amount. Uh, and uh, the person there at the desk said, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll send you the money right now, you know. Uh, and the 230 million were sent out of the Russian budget right away, and they followed a very, very complicated uh, route. I mean, they were sent to the bank accounts of these three companies at first, uh, based in Russia, then bank accounts of another two companies, and the third layer of companies. This is only in Russia. Then from Russia, they left via a bank account at a bank that in the meantime was shut down for in, uh, being involved in money laundering. So the money went to uh, Moldova. Uh, and from Moldova, some of the money went to the UK, some of the money went to uh, the British Virgin Islands, um, and so on. Now, again, all it takes to investigate this is to go company by company by company and connect, connect the people. But it also, again, it takes a lot of uh, uh, on the field investigative reporting because once you you find out for instance that the company went to the uh, you know that, uh, that, that the money went to the company in Moldova Bunicon in PEXRLA for instance um, it's easy to, to spot uh, to spot you know what's what's going on and I'll show you I'll show you a picture again this is where Bunicon the company that received millions and millions uh, you know of dollars is based in Chisinau in the capital of Moldova it's right here. Uh, this, it's, it, there's even a small, small tree growing in front of the, of the house. What, what kind of company is this? I'm asking you, you know? Now, this company, this, uh, the company based in this house, had a bank account where the money was wired two streets over, so two blocks over, you know? So for the bank, it would have been easier to see, okay, so there's lots of millions pouring in into the bank accounts of this, uh, you know, of this company, so let's, let's, but take a peek and see exactly what's, what's this company about. 
And when you see something like this, you say, well, wait, 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 but there's something wrong here, right? Now, and again, it's, it's a back and forth, you know, it's a back and forth between Google, between databases. In this case, you know, we use the Moldovan registry of companies that is publicly available as well, although for a fee. Um, but it's also keep in mind about patterns. Once you identify that, you know, millions and millions are poured into, company, into a company that is based here, uh, what you should always do is to, to, to challenge that, you know, in your, in your head and assume that there's other companies in this house. You know, and then what you do, you know, in uh, some registries of companies, as in the Moldovan one, it's possible to see, to check all the companies that are based here. And you'll find out about uh, 14 companies, all of them involved in high-level fraud. A company that was involved in defrauding the uh, Moldovan pension fund. Uh, I mean, all sorts of, you know, I mean, everything hosted here is like a haunted house, right? It's like where, where this, you know, the criminals hide, you know? Um, okay. Once you, once you identify this, uh, you know, uh, you can go further. And this is actually an, an important point for you, for, for Bulgaria, because you know that Cyprus is a big investor in, in your country, right? Cyprus is a small country, but it's uh, one of the biggest investors when it comes to actually uh, money and companies and, and things like this. And why do you think that is? Why do you think Cyprus is one of the biggest investors? I mean, of course, it's not Cyprus. It's your guys here using Cyprus-based companies for two main reasons. One of the reasons was uh, uh, presented by Christophe, and that is called tax optimization, which in many cases it's legal. It's immoral, of course, but it's legal. Um, now, the other uh, outright criminal reason is that, you know, these guys are politicians. These guys are, you know, criminals that are not supposed to get contracts with your state, that are not supposed to, you know, rob you of, uh, of uh, your money, you know, to take money out of your pockets. So this is the second reason why people are using companies in Cyprus or in uh, Switzerland or in, you know, in, in many, many, many other places. So in this case, some of the money went to Cyprus. Um, but again, as in the case of Panama, at some point in time, exactly actually when uh, Cyprus joined the EU, they had to put online a registry uh, of, uh, of companies. So right now it's possible to get you know, information from Cyprus. Uh, so, and it costs 10 euros per record. So it's, it's kind of expensive, but it's, it's really easy to, to, to get the records. So we noticed that some of the money went to a company called Prevazon Holdings Limited in Cyprus. And we got these companies um, records uh, and you know it it goes something like this you know each company obviously has a name and a, and a number usually and some sort of uh, uh, financials attached to it and stuff but most important you know is when you actually get to the people so we found out that um, one of the shareholders of this uh, of this company Cyprus that received the, uh, the money from the Moscow tax office uh, was actually Denis Katsiv who's the son of the former Minister of Transport in, uh, in the Moscow region in Russia. Right now, he's actually the main advisor for the Russian Railways, one of the biggest companies in, in Russia, for Mr. Yakunin. So we found out that some of the money went to this company, and then we went on and on with our investigation. You know, uh, we went, because this is, this is very, very complex, right? The, the, the network that they put together. Uh, and we also found out that Actually, this is the lady that approved the, the, the tax return, the fraudulent tax return, you know, from the, from the Russian uh, government. So she got some of the money. Actually, her husband, ex-husband now, got some of the money. So you always have this, um, you know, very, very complex scheme, but in the end is theft. You know, money is taken from point A and it's deposited in point B. And usually, um, you know, criminals and uh, corrupt politicians they like to show off and they like to maybe buy luxury cars and we can see plenty in Sofia as you can see plenty in Bucharest. Not all of those, are, of course, are criminals, the, the drivers of those cars, but many. You know, uh, they like to buy some nice real estate and there's, there's just a few places in the world where they would actually put their money. Because imagine what, this money was uh, stolen from Russia. What would be the incentive for the thieves to place the money back in Russia? They know that you can steal from Russia, you know? They, they don't feel safe there. 
because they know what's, what's possible, what's in the realm of possible there. So uh, these guys would always ch choose the usual places to deposit their money, like Switzerland, like Monaco maybe, like the US, like the UK. So you, you kind of have to, to understand how they work and to, uh, to look for them in the usual places. Now, uh, the US is one of the places where these guys love to invest, you know? And uh, New York and Florida and ca California, you know, there are some, some really special places for, for these people, you know? They want to be seen in Miami Beach. They want to be seen in New York, you know? They want to be, you know, um, seen in LA, in Hollywood somewhere, you know, in Beverly Hills. So those places are the first places where you need to look. And it happens that some of those places are really easy to, to access. I mean, there are databases that allow you access to company data, uh, property data, you know, and, and other types of, uh, type of data. Um, because you see, the complexity of this makes it vulnerable. Going across so many countries means that you know, you go across many data regimes. You go across many, you know, places where maybe information is hard to get, but some places, you know, in some places it's easier to get. So let, let's take this example. Um, so in this case, at some point, uh, we went to, and then I'll show you something funny right away. We went to a database called ACRIS which is free of charge, everybody can access it. And by the way, I will give you an address from where you can get all these uh, databases, you know, so uh, that you can use. And ACRIS is the New York State uh, Registry of Property. And you can track down here every, like, person that has property in New York or uh, juridical person or company that has uh, property in New York. In this case, we looked for Prevazon, for the Cyprus company. You always do multiple type of searches, so you, you create a spreadsheet, with the names that you're interested in. You know, I was interested in this case in Dennis Katsi, in Prevazon, in a number of other, and you run those through databases, you know. And very often, you don't get any result, you know, because maybe you don't look in the, in the right place. But, you know, when something pops up, that's where your investigation is. So in this case, we found out that Prevazon was actually owning quite a bit of uh, uh, property in New York. Some, um, in, this, um, in this skyscraper, that it's uh, at the interse intersection of uh, Wall Street, and Broad Street, which goes into Broadway. So it's li right in the heart of Manhattan, you know. This, was, this is high-end property. And, you know, in, it was in, in the tune of about 30 plus million uh, dollars. So these, these are the money that went through that house in, in Kishino. And now it ended up, you know, in a really nice property in Manhattan. So you see how, how it goes. Um, now, once we identified this and we exposed all this, this is what, what hurts them, uh, finding exactly where the money goes. Because the New York prosecution started a case, used our reporting, and seized this property. And there's a, uh, an on, uh, froze this uh, property. There's an ongoing court case right now, you know, against these guys. Uh, and they fight, you know, to the debt, you know, to get back these luxury apartments, you know, that, uh, yeah. Um, so, these are, you know, I mean, you see, a, a simple case, a, 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 a more complex case. There's even more complex cases, a lot, a lot more complex. For instance, this is something that we uh, documented, you know, and published in the end of the year. Part of this story was published with the Independent in, in London. This is the theft of 20 billion US dollars. So we, we're going higher and higher. I mean, the, the amounts are st uh, staggering. In this case, we document, so the money was stolen from Russia again, and it went through one bank account in Moldova, and then it ended up in the EU in a bank account in Latvia, and from there, you know, to various, various paths. But you see, in this case, what we realized was that following the money and following the companies and the people was not enough, because this was arranged by banks. So what we did, we decided to follow the banker, to follow the, you know, the banks, to follow who owns those banks. And what we found out was quite amazing, actually, because there were a number of banks in Russia that were completely crooked. Uh, one bank in Moldova, one bank in Latvia, and then some banks in the EU. Now, all these guys knew what was going on um, for uh, very, very simple reasons. For instance, one of the guys that would wire the money, you know, and uh, talking about these uh, billions and billions, was, for instance, let me find the guy was this guy, you know, let me, let me go down.
So this guy, you know, who's uh, a poor guy from uh, a village in Moldova. You see here is he's drinking a Baltica beer in, in the other picture. Baltica, that's, that's really cheap beer. Now, do you see this guy as a billionaire at all? I mean, he's, I mean, you know, the guy is really poor. And when we went to interview him, we asked him, so how come you transferred all this money? How come you, you know, you were involved in all this, you know? I said, what money? I mean, I have no idea what's, of, of what's going on. Uh, but this comes down to stolen identities, and uh, we'll talk a little bit later about it. Um, so the game is always up, always up. And in, in this case, you know, in the, uh, what we dubbed the laundromat, this uh, money laundering in the tune of 20 billion, some of the money actually went to extremist uh, political parties in the EU, you know. So there's, there's, <laughs> there's uh, lots, lots of stories behind it. But when you looked at the bankers involved, you know, this, this kind of stuff is not possible without the complicity of uh, high-level politicians. So one of the main bankers involved in this uh, fraud, in the theft of the 20 billion, was actually uh, the cousin of uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, Mr. Igor Putin. So Mr. Igor Putin, it, it, it goes something like this. You know, Mr. Igor Putin was a, a member of the board of uh, this uh, Russian uh, land bank, RZB, which was connected to the uh, bank in Moldova and, and so on and so on. So again, what we did in this case, we treated the banks just as companies because banks are companies. Um, and we actually have an ongoing project that covers Bulgaria as well. We look, uh, we look for all these uh, ownership projects, you know, so we have a media ownership project where we also looked with Atanas uh, from Bivol, who's going to be, be here later. Uh, you know, um, uh, we, we looked at the ownership of media, we, and we're looking right now at the ownership of banks in Bulgaria and all of, over the region because what's going on is, is just insane. You know, we notice lots of uh, offshore type of companies involved in banks, you know, and those same companies being involved in fraud, uh, in various types of fraud and, and all that. But let's, let's, uh, take, uh, let's talk in, in a few words about how is this possible? I mean, at one point in time, what I realized together with my colleagues in the network was that we are investigating the same thing over and over again. It was always, you know, the, the offshore company, the fraud, the politician, the mobster, the same, same thing. So at that point, I decided that we need, to, uh, we need to go elsewhere to investigate. We need to investigate what allows for this to happen. Because this is, uh, we saw this as a platform. It's what we called at some point a proxy platform. Uh, we saw, you, you see, because all those structures, all these companies that are established in order to, uh, to create a fraud, they must be created by someone, you know. And don't, don't, uh, don't ever think that those guys that like to steal money like to put so much uh, work in it. It's, it's hard work to create all those companies and to create the paperwork for those and the bank accounts, you know. And the thieves are thieves in the first place because they don't like to work. So there's something else there, you know, uh, someone else, you know, who's putting all this together. Um, so this is, you know, um, what I titled in my presentation, how do they hide? And there's, just briefly, I usually, you know, do this for four or five days with lots of stuff, you know, and, but just, just for the sake of, you know, um, just outlining it. Um, there are four main elements to the crime. The first one is the uh, enablers, the formation agents. These are the people that set up all those, uh, all those very complex, uh, intricate uh, kind of structures. And let me put a face to one of these guys. Uh, this guy was very active here in, uh, uh, in Bulgaria, actually. You know. His name is Laszlo Kish. He was based in Bucharest, in Romania. Uh, very active in, uh, in, in Bulgaria, I repeat. Uh, establishing lots of companies for uh, Bulgarian mobsters as well as for Romanian mobsters. Now, this guy is one of those enablers. He would be, you know, sitting in his office in Piazza Victoria. This is the central, uh, one of the center squares in Bucharest. And he would just receive mobsters in his office and the mobsters or corrupt politicians would say, hey, I have this problem. I need to bring into the country $100 million. How do I do it without the law enforcement getting wind of it? How do I? Oh, the guy would just give you a solution right away. So what we did is we went undercover. We went to his office. We pretended we have these two problems. One was a large amount of money that we need to put in, back into the country, and the other one was that we have this mineral oil uh, somewhere in a country in Africa, and we also want to bring it into the country without paying taxes. 
In both cases, uh, Mr. Kish took a piece of paper, A4, and uh, a pen and said, oh, okay, so I have to establish for you a company here uh, in Bulgaria, actually, that is gonna be owned by a company in Cyprus, that's gonna be owned by a company in the Seychelles, that's gonna be owned by a company in Delaware. We said, okay, so how much? How much is it? Uh, and he said, okay, for the two schemes, you know, I'll charge you $12,000, uh, but then I also want 1% of the profit. So you see these guys are not just enablers, they are parting it. And I bet you there, there are a few Mr. Kishis right here in Sofia, and they are just a few. Now, Mr. Kish was uh, actually uh, was arrested. Uh, I think I have uh, somewhere, the, yeah, somewhere. He's handcuffed here, you see? Uh, after we, we reported on all this, after, you know. And um, um, the, the, the law enforcement seized his uh, computers from his office. But you see, the law enforcement were looking for a particular case. And this is what always happens. Law enforcement is very focused, you know. They want to get things done, and they don't want to spread too thin, you know. Like, for us, for journalists, you know, the same information that law enforcement has, has a different value. Uh, so in this case, for instance, they, uh, they um, um, you know, investigated Mr. Kish for this particular deal, but when they attached the proof to the, to the court case, which became public, you know, the moment it was attached, it was in court, we made a request as journalists to access all those, uh, all those information, all that information, and we found out a hard disk that was attached to the file where Mr. Kish was listing all his clients, which happened to be high-level politicians, MPs in Romania, and all sorts of you know, and we presented this about three years ago. Guess what? 80% of that list is now in jail because those guys were, were, were involved in, in fraud. You know, they were involved in high-level fraud. So getting access to records of Mr. Kish, getting access to, to, brain, to, to the brain of Mr. Kish, you know, it's, it's, it's really it's a goldmine for journalists. And there are a few... Um, he was a lawyer slash accountant, you know. Uh, but but th these are the guys that enable this. Now, how is it possible for Mr. Kish to establish a company in the Seychelles or in Cyprus? Or It's because he's part of a network. He's part of this large network, actually, of Mr. Kishes, you know, a network that uh, was led until we exposed it. We don't know right now if it's still operating, uh, by, by a guy called Ian Taylor that was based in Vanuatu, of all places, you know. Uh, he was a British citizen living in Australia, New Zealand, and all that. So there's all these Mr. Kishis all over the world, and they take care of business. So these are the formation agents. Second, the second element of, of the crime, of, uh, of the tools that criminals are using, um, are obviously the offshore companies, and I won't insist on that, because, but uh, I already highlighted the two uses, tax optimization and hiding actual ownership because people are criminals or, or politici corrupt politicians. Just one thing here, don't think about uh, offshore companies just in the sense of companies in Cyprus or in the Caymans or in the Belize. There's offshore companies you know, in Austria. They are called Privatstiftungs. They're offshore-like companies. They, they ensure the same level of secrecy just as an offshore company from the Caymans or from Belize. So you, you can have an offshore company here in, in Bulgaria. You, know? you can have, again, offshore type of company, same level of secrecy. So, I mean, offshore is kind of a perimated term. Uh, I mean, people are using companies all over the world in order to hide. Um, the third element to this is the proxies. You know, the, the people, these people like Kish need other people to face, to front for criminals or corrupt politicians in companies. And I showed you uh, that guy, you know, with a, with a beer. You know, that, that guy is one, of, uh, one such proxy, you know. Uh, in, and there are three types of proxies, three ta uh, main types of proxies. Uh, there are the unaware proxies, like this guy, whose identity was stolen, or he gave the pass passport to someone, and uh, you know that person photocopied the passport and then established a bunch of companies uh, with this guy's uh, name. We, we had a case when we were tracking down money laundered by the Sinaloa drug cartel, uh, you know, the Mexican drug cartel, and laundered via uh, a bank in Latvia. And we found out this, um, you know, bank account belonging to a, a guy from Saint Petersburg. Uh, the, the bank account was in the tune of 680 million dollars, uh, and the guy had no idea about it. You know, he was like, "What? I have 680 million, you know, in my account?" Yes, you do. <laughs> you know, um, so um, 
these are the, the proxies that are not aware of what they're doing, you know. And these can be beggars from the street. I just go and, you know, take, give him like, you know, a few bucks and get the, the documents and establish a company. Um, and then there are, you know, the, the proxies that, uh, that know what they're doing without knowing uh, what the companies will be doing after they are established, you know. So these are professional proxies. You'll see them, you know, owning hundreds of companies at the same time. Um, and, you know, I mean, as, as, as Christophe said, you know, you, you can f have an address where you have hundreds of companies. Now, there is one address, and this is actually a very cool speech by Obama, by the president of the U.S., uh, before he became the president, he was very anti-offshore and, you know, he was fighting to clean up the, the act with the offshores. And at some point in a speech he said something like, there's this house in the Caymans where there are more than 10,000 companies. This is either the biggest building in the world or the biggest fraud in the world. You know, so this is how, how it goes, you know. Uh, you can have people like, like these or uh, proxies that are aware of what they're doing, owning at the same time 600, 1,000 companies, even more, you know. And of course, is it possible for a human to manage that number of companies? I mean, it's, it, it's impossible, right? They're just fronts for, for others. Um, so we have the facilitators, so the formation agents like the Kishis, we have um, the offshore companies, we have these, um, uh, these proxies, and some of them, you know, sometimes Mr. Kish himself will be a proxy, and then he knows exactly what's going on. And that's when you see these guys uh, proxying, uh, being, you know, like fronts, for, that's like huge business usually. That's like really, really the big, big business is there. And the fourth element, I already mentioned it actually uh, while talking about the laundromat and the uh, theft of 20 billion, is the banks. Banks are, you know, you, you got to have banks in your pocket in order to be able to do this sort of uh, stuff. And with banks, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's easy basically. You, 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 you got to have the ownership of some of these banks. And usually these are small banks. These are not bank, banks that you you know, enter the door and you open up a bank account. These are VIP banks, you know, these are uh, banks for high net worth individuals and, uh, and so on. Um, so it's, it's really important, uh, you know, to look at the ownership of banks, especially in our region, in Eastern Europe. It's crazy what's going on. I mean, you see so many banks owned by crooks, you know, that, that you know, I mean, we're, we're very, 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 very much focused on, on this. But, you know, how come the money ended up in banks in the EU? I mean, banks that you'd say they are, you know, except maybe for HSBC, you heard about Swiss leaks, right? Uh, so HSBC and other banks, we actually see that they're, they're sometimes involved in uh, high-level fraud, you know. Uh, but, you know, potentially, you know, this, this should be clean banking institutions, you know. But what happens is, is very, very simple. I have company A that sends money to company B. Company A has uh, the bank account in, uh, let's say, Russia. Company B has the bank account in Latvia. The Latvian bank, what they will do, because they have to know their customer, know your customer, KYC. It's, it's a policy that goes across banks, and there are various you know, provisions when it comes to money laundering. But what they're doing is they're just looking if company A is in good standing. That means, you know, to get a certificate of the company. Okay, the company exists, there's a guy in it, there's, you know, and if company B is in good standing. And that's all they do, you know. Now, they don't care that the guy that owns company A, you know, is that guy with a beer, with a Baltica beer, which is, I mean, a search away. You, you can find out, you know, that, look, I mean, that's not possible that this guy is sending these millions, you know. So it would be actually um, very, very easy work. But banks don't do this, you know. Banks just, just stop there. Um, Okay, so how do we actually investigate them? That is, I mentioned already, databases. Um, I created an initiative called the Investigative Dashboard. So this is uh, the website from where you can, uh, I'm trying to get to it, uh, from where you can get down to these databases. Uh, the Investigative Dashboard has three parts. One is where we index uh, a lot of data. We scrape data and we also cooperate with a great organization called Open Corporates. Uh, which is scraping lots of registries of companies uh, around the world. We are doing the same and uh, we, we work with them. So this is where you can start searching. And we have, for instance, here the, uh, uh, Christoph was mentioning the Lux Luxembourg Gazettes. We have them indexed here. We have the Panama companies uh, indexed here. We have Swi Swiss companies indexed here and many, many others. And we also uh, index um, not only registers of companies, but official gazettes. Official gazettes are very, very important because they can give you information that you can't find in the registries of, uh, of companies. And each, uh, each, uh, each country has both. 
the Registry of Companies and the Official Gazette, and they both contain information on, on companies. Uh, the, the middle part is, you know, you'll find here a directory of the databases that I mentioned. So lots, lots, lots of, uh, you know, uh, databases here. Um, you, and you pick the country, Panama, and you see all those databases that I mentioned. You pick the U.S., you'll find, you know, and, and so on. The U.S. is actually uh, state by state, you know, and you can go through it. Um, and there's another part of it because, you know what, some of this work is very, very expensive, unfortunately. Do you know how much it is to get a Delaware company record? It's $50, which is, you know, you get it, only to find out that the company in Delaware is owned by a company in Cyprus. That means another 10 euros. And then you find out that that company is owned by a company. So sometimes this is a very costly process. So this is why, uh, you know, we're all for journalists to, to, do, to do it themselves and go from database to database if you have the money, you know. But if you don't, there's another uh, section that I established here is called the research desk where we have researchers in various geographies. We have researchers in the Middle East, in Latin America, in, of course, in Europe, in the US, in Africa. And uh, what these researchers do, you create an account, it's free of charge, and you ask, I want to know who owns this company in Cyprus. You know, and you give the name of the company. Or I'd like to know if my prime minister and the name, you know, owns companies uh, anywhere. Um, okay, so there's actually a lot, <laughs> a lot to talk about. I, I, I will stop here, maybe leave for some questions or? Or am I off? We don't. You can uh, wrap up if you want, yeah. and then we can. Uh, so I mean, uh, I would just advise you to, to use this, uh, you know, this uh, the, the website Investigate Dashboard. Uh, there's another one called Visual Investigative Scenarios where you can visualize data. I didn't go into that, but I will provide you with the links and all that. I mean, there's there's a lot to talk about, you know, in this very very short span of time. But I think databases can be a great start for the investigative work, and then you have to do the real work, the footwork. Thank you very much, Bo. Um, Предполагам, че имате въпроси към Бо. Много от нещата, за които той говори, се случват и в момента в България. Някой? Thanks. My name is Irina from Bulgarian National Radio. Uh, Paul, do you have any requests from uh, Bulgaria coming for this third part of uh, your platform? And uh, the second question is, are you sure that uh, these criminals and crooks, they are not using your um, investigations as well to make uh, their practices better in hiding? And the third question, if I may, uh, do you... Uh, do you have any kind of connections with law enforcement in these different uh, countries uh, in advance or during the process of your journalistic investigation? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll take them one by one. Um, the first one, yes, we get some requests from uh, Bulgaria, very few, very few, and uh, especially from our partners, uh, Bivol. Um, then, uh, second question, are criminals using this? Oh, for sure. Yes, they are. And I will... Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, what we're doing right now, um, uh, we, we have, a, I think, a great programming team at OCCRP that is led by Smarty McCarthy. Smarty McCarthy is one of the guys, one of the founders of Wikileaks, uh, and he works with us on... What we're doing is we're, we, we are identifying patterns. So, for instance, sometimes you don't even have to know, to know a name to find a fraud. It's like once you investigate a particular case and you see there's a type of setup where you have a company, a local company that is owned by two Belize companies that are owned by this particular Seychelles company, that is a pattern. And you can just create a search over that pattern and go out, you know, with data and identify criminal groups that are using these patterns. And then you go from there into identifying the politicians, the, the actual names in the, in the fraud. So yes, I mean, you can, you can have various types of approaches to uh, investigating uh, uh, organized crime and corruption. You can start from tech, actually, directly from tech. We're doing now this uh, big da data analysis where we got all the data from the UK company's house, the registry of companies there. And we know that if these two particular Belize companies show up in a context, that, that's this crime group. 
if these two other companies show up or if this address from Belize shows up, we know it's this criminal group. So imagine this uh, being done at the level of, uh, you know, like uh, world data. You know, you, you go from country to country and you identify exactly those, those patterns. That will allow you not only to identify the criminal group, but many times to do what we call pre-crime, which is a pretentious term, but um, it happened in quite a few instances that we uh, identified that the criminal group is operating in a country and we exposed their activities before they started operating. They just created the infrastructure. They just created the, the companies. They just, and we exposed them and we exposed the fact that they use the same structures in other countries and look what they did. And it's up to the local authorities to stop them or not, you know, or to the people or to whatever. But, you know, criminals are very often using our work and criminals are, are actually really bright people. They are, they are amazing people. Some of them, if they would have uh, wanted to go into legit business, they would have been maybe the next Bill Gates or the next whatever, you know, really big entrepreneur. So these are not dumb people at all. You know, these are not the guys that sell, you know, like drugs at the corner of the street and that, you know, hit people in the head and stuff like this. These, these are really, really, really clever people. Now, some of these, these guys are, are using us. I'll give you one example. We exposed a guy in, uh, uh, in Russia and who has businesses all over the place and we exposed him and he got really angry at us, you know, and, but we always talk to these people. So we called him after we reported, like say, look, you know, I mean, this is the, the reporting, this is, you know, we presented your activities and all that. And he was like really mad. But guess what happened a few weeks later? He called us and he said, hey guys, if you're so honest as you pretend to be, you know, uh, you, then you'll publish this information that I'll give you right now. You know, I paid for the Prime Minister of this country to go to the uh, final of the uh, European Championship in Germany and he sat next to Angela Merkel and I paid a private jet for him, I paid hotel at the Kempinski and all that, that kind of stuff. And I said, yes, we're very interested in this. So he sent us the data, we of course verified it, we'll never just publish, you know, and we published it. Did he use us? Yes, he did. But it was in the public interest. I mean, the you know, the, 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 the country had to know about it, you know, what's going on with their prime minister. So yes, there, there's always this, uh, you know, kind of kind of game going on. And there was another question. Oh, uh, law enforcement, yeah. So uh, we don't work with, with law enforcement, uh, although if you talk to these mobsters that we are exposing, they all think we are law enforcement. Uh, they look at our funding at ours and they say, oh, they are FBI, CIA, they're, they're, because there's always this paranoia in their world, you know, that. It, it can't be a journalist that digs through databases and that comes and shows them all their, you know, all their network all over the world. It's got to be something more powerful, not this insignificant guy in front of me. So, uh, uh, but then, um, I mean, we have interactions with law enforcement in the sense that we interview law enforcement. We actually also train law enforcement. So three weeks ago, I trained uh, prosecutors in Bucharest, you know, and uh, uh, people in the uh, in compliance departments of banks, you know, people that are uh, should be able to detect fraud. Uh, I also trained people from the Czech Secret Service, you know, but those were open, uh, you know, workshops where there were activists, journalists, you know, Secret Service, whatever, whoever wanted to, to apply. So that's our, yeah. Имате ли други въпроси? Някои? Ами, в основа на разследването имаше ли позитивен резултат за селените от село Чавдар? Да, има всички импакт. You know, there's peop journalists in our area are always um, a little bit disappointed with what's going on after we publish the investigative report because we always um, uh, expect that the law enforcement must act, that the prosecution should start a case right away, that, you know, that something should happen. But in reality, very, very um, rarely something happens. What happens though, when you expose criminals like this, with all their infrastructure, with all their companies, you hurt them much more than if the, the law enforcement would start an investigation. Um, because they're not able to do business as usual. You basically kill their network, and they have to set up a new network, and that takes a lot, a lot of time. So they suddenly are, are not able to use those New Zealand companies and those Latvian companies that are connected to the Seychelles companies. So very often we get actually letters from the lawyers of uh, corrupt politicians or mobsters who ask us to take 
data down from our website because what we do with our reporting, we don't just post the narrative, but we post databases with the companies, with the connections, relationships, and all that. And that hurts them. Uh, we get letters saying, hey, my client just wanted, uh, went to that bank to get a, a loan from, for 100 million uh, euros, and he couldn't because uh, you know, the bank said, look what this website says about you, you know? or look what this, this article says. And you know, that, that hurts them. So there are lots of impact. For instance, the, the bank in Latvia that we exposed uh, with the, in the 20 billion fraud, uh, they lost their Moody's rating completely. And that, that's a big blow for a bank, you know, to lose the, the Moody's rating. Um, there are people that uh, were thrown to jail. There's a, there was a property confiscated, you know, like the, the property that I mentioned in New York. Now, of course, there's a court case there, so we don't know if the state will take it or not in the end, but for now it's, it's frozen. There are bank accounts that, that are frozen. There, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of impact, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Marina de Heus, Open Society. Uh, you've mentioned that some radical political parties have been funded through such schemes. Could you please elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so um, what happened is one of the Russian banks involved in, uh, uh, in the laundromat, in the theft of the 20 billion, uh, is called the First Czech Russian Bank. And this is uh, the same bank that was exposed by Mediapart in France. Mediapart is a, if you, allow the uh, comparison, the, the bivol of France, let's say, you know, ex except much, much bigger. Um, so um, Mediapart exposed this bank giving a loan to uh, Marine Le Pen and to the National Front, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, yeah, real money and real, yeah. Uh, we couldn't pro uh, find proof of, uh, of the UKIP or something like that. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, sort of a close uh, closeness between you know Russia and these uh, parties but um, we, we tracked down some of the money in the UK this is why we published with the independent um, and um, we found money going to various groups there uh, various people there and you know some of the money paid for the daughter of this oligarch to go to this um, really expensive primary school the best primary school so there were all sorts of uh, usage uh, usages for money from this platform some of the money was turned into and that's another outcome of our reporting uh, in um, this luxury resort, uh, resort in uh, Montenegro at the sea there. And uh, you know, they were about to uh, close this deal with Kempinski. Kempinski was supposed to use it, you know, and as a result of our reporting, Kempinski backed off the deal and now the property is for sale. So there's yeah, all this sort of uh, outcome. How do you fund your activities, your network? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the network right now, uh, we have about $1.6 million as a budget, uh, yearly budget, uh, but there's more than one organization. There are lots of organizations under this uh, umbrella. So it's from Russia all the way to Albania, to Central Europe, you know. Um, uh, most of the money comes right now from USAID. Uh, second is the Swiss government. Uh, third, Open Society. Uh, what I showed you, the investigative dashboard, so I established it first with uh, seed funding from uh, Open Society, but then Google Ideas liked the idea and they are now working with us and giving us some money for that. Uh, we have uh, individual donors um, and uh, we have, uh, at the level of centers, uh, we have this uh, small kind of, uh, you know, PayPal kind of payments and stuff like that, so that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> 